So I'll be talking about one of the most important you know, questions in human existence. That is the origin of life. How life you know, evolved in our planet. Can you have this of the lights off? <coughs> Now, in my talk, there are two aspects. One is, of course, the impact events in our earth. And it so happened, Carl Sagan made a sort of tremendous, tremendous contribution. And so I really try to sort of assemble you know, two disparate concepts into one and make a sort of you know, narrative story. Okay? And uh, this is such a famous you know, quotation that comets get and comets you know, take that away. Really, in this talk you'll see comets are more specifically meteorites. They are really the giver of life and also they are the taker of life. Carl Sagan really, really made a fantastic contributions. And guess what? his wife, Lynn Margulis. This is really the second part of the talk. And of course, Lynn's, you know, that endocybiotic origin of eukaryotes in every textbook in biology will find it. This is such an important, you know, contribution in biology. And uh, so, what happened? I was, uh, you know, writing a book, and this was the first chapter of the book called The River of Life. And I say in the chapter to me, you know, because she knows everything and whether she would be kind enough to review. After a month, you know, I found a sort of big message in my telephone half an hour. Oh, I liked it, there's something so wrong, and I have to come, you know, I have to talk to you, you know, face to face. Okay? And so eventually I called her secretary. And she said, yes, you know, she, she, you know, she's busy, but she'll be happy to come to Love of Texas. And so, we, you know, we arranged a talk, and of course, you know, Lynn gave two, you know, very nice talk at the campus, in biology and at the museum, and of course, she really wanted to talk to me, you know, about that uh, manuscript, okay? And it was really a fantastic time for me to hear, you know, from a master in biology. And then I took Lynn to one of her field area since, you know, we don't have much time. I didn't want to tell you all the speakers who came. If you come next time, promise, you know, in just one hour trip from, you know, from campus, we have a dinosaur day. You can collect your own dinosaurs. And so this is what she wanted. So I took her, you know, this is called the dog hunt. This is really the beginning of, you know, dinosaur age. And she had real good time. Okay. She collected so many things and you know she kept a note. So this is how we came to know her. And of course, so this endosymbiotic origin, I'll use the same thing at, at a lower level, at a molecular level. And Lynn said, look, I don't like your term. You cannot use my endosymbiotic, you know, for the molecular rearrangement for this. And then I had to come up with some term, and you know, some others, she never got the term, and I could not come up with the term. And guess what? It's really the Bruce Clark who suggested this name. And I'm so indebted to Bruce that, you know, he suggested that this is really, since before life, it could be endocrypide. So these two top scientists in American history, Carl Sagan and Lynn Margulis, without knowing, they really contributed from the two different disciplines, one of the greatest questions in human existence, the, the origin of life, and I'm trying to make a story. And of course, that son, who happens to be one of the very good science writers, and we are very proud that Dorian came to the symposium. Thank you, Julian. 
Now, meteorites got a bad rap. All the children know, you know, what happened to the dinosaurs, okay? <laughs> so we always thought they're destructive. And yes, in fact, I was also very much involved about this dinosaur extinction. And we discovered one of the largest craters. In fact, if it is true, this will be the largest crater in the history of our planet, which we call, you know, Shiva. And the other crater is sort of Mexico. So most likely, this huge asteroid split into two, one fell in Mexico, the other in the west coast of India, and this is what happened to the dinosaur. Now, we knew that dinosaur death is really not so bad, simply because if dinosaur did not die out, placenta mammals, they would not flourish. They actually lived with dinosaurs, you know, for millions of years. So dinosaurs really mean sort of, you know, that niche were really occupied by the mammals. In other words, if dinosaur did not die out, mammals would not flourish, and I will not be talking in front of you. Okay? So the meteorites, you know, they are not really all bad. But what we'll see, that they are also the very important thing, you know, they renew life. In fact, probably they made the major contribution about the origin of life, and again, thanks to Carl Sagan, you know, who thought long time back. So these two sides of the meteorites, one is the destruction, one is this renewal. It's almost like, you know, like the Hindu god Shiva, you know, it's really the cosmic dance of Shiva. Okay. Now, as I said, this is one of the biggest questions in human existence, how life might have really evolved, okay? And every culture, every, you know, religious uh, scripture books you'll find, it starts with the story of Genesis, how life, you know, might have been started. Of course, you know, it's very simple. God says there will be life, and so there is life. And so every generation, they really has to read out the book of Genesis. So what we're really doing it, we're also you know, giving our view. And maybe after 50 years, next generation, they'll come up with a much, much more refined view about the Genesis of life. One well, interesting twist in this debate that Darwin did not participate. In this whole origin of species, if you read, he never mentioned about the origin of life. He said, you know, I just cannot handle. But in a letter, this is one of the most important historical letter, he wrote to his, you know, botanist friend, Hooker, that, oh, if, if there is sort of one little pond, you know, this has become a very catchy phrase, that if there was one little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphorus and salts, heat, electricity, a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. This is one of the profound insights. Think of it in a letter, and not only that, he added two more lines. That once the very first life formed, they would gobble up all these chemicals, so there will be no second life. So life origin is just one, and it's a singularity, one unique event. Since Darwin did not handle, did not, you know, sort of grapple with these questions. It was really left, left for many, many years. Almost 50 years, nobody really talked about the origin of life. Then, two gentlemen, entirely from the different parts of the world, one from Russia, one from England, they said, you know, there should be a beginning of a beginning. We have to start entirely from the scientific point of view. You know, we may be wrong, that's okay. And so that's the really beginning of this whole quest for the original, okay? And this is really, it started in 24 and 27 by Operin and Horden. 
And then, of course, I discuss about these things. And that process, that is, maybe, maybe we can create the very simple form of life, like simple bacteria in the lab. And it has been tried almost for 50 years all over the world. Because, you know, we all want to play God. And if we can create just one little bacteria, then something. And they tried and tried. And eventually they gave it up in the 70s that, yes, probably there's something wrong which we cannot do it in lab. Maybe Mother Nature can. And of course, one of these element, one of the parameter which is missing is the time. You cannot, you can create everything, the right temperature, right pressures, right you know, chemical constraints. What you cannot simulate in the lab, you cannot simulate millions of years in say a few weeks or a few months. Time cannot be simulated and this is why this, this whole pursuit to produce life in this you know, test tube has been sort of abandoned. Then, you know, these are the four disparate events happened. And eventually there, you know, this is really the right time. It's a very exciting time. All this evidence, they're really converging to just one area. And it's, just, it's a good example of serendipity. You know, they are not really, they are not the origin of life people. They are doing their other things. But the evidence is really pointing to that direction. So the second thing happened, so this is the first attempt, you know, just to produce a very simple life in, in the lab. Second, of course, in 60s, probably one of the most unifying concepts. It's just like the theory of evolution, biology, the tect tectonic, you know, took shape. Anything in geology can be explained by that tectonic. It is so simple, so elegant, so geometric. And so, you know, there is no, uh, you know, no much, for example, now we know where there will be mountain, where there will be, you know, so all the geological features could be really explained by this plate tectonics. And basically these are the, you know, three plate boundaries. Especially after when it has been accepted in the 70s, scientists really wanted to go to the ocean floor. Because most of the plate boundaries, they are at the floor of the oceans. And they put the submersible orbit at the floor of the ocean just to see how the plates are separating. Okay. If you really go to the bottom of the ocean, so you'll see just like the seam of a baseball, these are sort of all the plate boundaries. Okay? And some of them, especially the ridge, they look like sort of mountain, like rocky mountains, you know, going. And they know that, you know, the lava is coming out. But when they actually you know, went down and looked at the spreading ridge, you know, they were amazed. They discovered an entirely new niche and probably the oldest environment still preserved in our planet. That is the hydrothermal vent. An entirely new kind of life. So think about it. They are doing the geology, geophysics, and yet as a byproduct, they stumble upon entirely new life which is not sustained by sunlight. Which is really you know, energized by the volcano, by the heat. And also at the same time, they're really looking for the oldest fossils. So geologists or paleontologists, they have to put in a time frame. They are the timekeeper. Is there any evidence we know that planet has been born 4.6 billion years ago. When is the oldest life has been found? And yes, at least there are in three places, you know, Greenland, South Africa, and Australia, the oldest life would be around 3.5 billion years. So there is that little window, okay? Maybe 4 billion to 3.5 billion years. This is the time when probably life formed. So this fossil evidence is also very important. Although they are just paleontologists, you know, they are not interested in the origin of life. But they actually contributed one of the very important time frame. Third, because of you know, Carl Sagan and Chris Chaiba and others, 
NASA became very interested. For a long time, people thought that space is empty. But space is so rich in organic molecules. In fact, life encouraging in a process really started before the birth of the solar system, before the birth of our planet. It was everywhere. It is pregnant with all these you know, life forming molecules. And that itself is a very interesting, you know, entire new concept. We don't have to make it in the lab. It's almost like going you go to a grocery and you buy these ingredients. It's not a quick thing. Then why do you bother? In fact, all the building blocks of life, as we'll discuss, we'll see, you can find in meteorites or in coins. So that's another new, you know, sort of source of evidence. Then I'll talk a little bit about Alan in meteorites because I was just a sort of witness. And finally, another branch, that's in molecular biology. They are trying to use this molecular claw and molecular phylogeny just to understand which is the oldest form of life. That's all. And what they found, the same bacteria they found in the main community, these thermophiles or these heat loving bacteria, they would turn out to be the oldest living organisms. And so this, all these you know, different fields, they all are you know, trying to converge. Now look here, this is very important. Francis Crick in 1988, he's this co-discoverer of DNA, you know, double helix. <coughs> he said, it is so improbable, it's just a miracle, you know, that life has been formed. Now we can tell it is not a miracle. It is comprehensible. Probably we now understand how life could have been formed. But we need all these evidence. We need geology, we need cosmology, we need biology, we need chemistry. If we can combine, then we can make a very good narrative. And this is what I am going to do it. In fact, I really believe this is almost like like tectonics in the 60s, we are in a, in a threshold of a sort of scientific revolution or paradigm shift. In a few years, in 15, 20 years, I think this origin of life will not be miracle, will not be mystery. It will be really, it will be understood and it could be reproduced. I really believe. Okay, so let's see our scientific quest. These two gentlemen, without knowing each other, they exactly came to the same conclusion. That is Alexander Okarin and of course J.B. Solden. And it's a very logical thing they did without you know, just intuition. At that time, we, they knew the, what the composition of Jupiter, mainly it's you know, gaseous, so it's mainly hydrogen, methane, ammonia, and water. So the reason, probably, this is the typical you know, composition of the primordial atmosphere of our planet. There is no oxygen, because you know, oxygen is, is biotic, produced by the cyanobacteria and plants. So this is before life, so there is no oxygen. It's a very porosity, very reducing environment. And they came up with a sort of simple, brilliant idea that these reducing gases, if there is a rain, if there is a thunder, if there is an electric discharge, they may combine, they may really form some kind of organic molecules, this will be deposited on the ocean surface, eventually it will be just like a sort of, you know, consistency of a soup, very thick soup, and this is that, you know, famous primordial soup. But there is one little hitch. These two gentlemen, Oparin really believed that this soup would be more like a sort of protein rich, whereas Holden believes it would be more like, you know, gene rich or like nucleic acid rich. And so which really came first as we go, we'll see that debate still going on, that is whether the protein or the nucleic acid, this is still going on. 
But they didn't pursue much. They said, you know, once there is a soup, then maybe sale is just next day. In other words, they really avoided the major big steps for the synthesis of life. So that idea of primordial soup, you know, lasted for almost you know, 30 years in all textbooks. And then this little, you know, sorry, this young guy at that time, Miller, he was just a sort of PhD student at Chicago, he said, okay, let's Let's simulate, you know, it's just not difficult. You know, it's really going back, it's, it's amazing that nobody really tasted that simple thing, whether it works or not. But Miller had that, you know, courage, and of course his uh, advisor was Yuri, Nobel laureate. So they really t took these four gases, which was in atmosphere, water, hydrogen, methane, and ammonia, and put it in this flask. They really simulated this, you know, early Earth. And you can see, this is the water, these are all these gases. This is the most funny thing here, you know. In just, at the end of the day, it turned into sort of really crimson red liquid. And in two weeks, he was able to synthesize, and guess what? He found almost, you know, out of 20 amino acids, he was able to produce 15 amino acids in the lab. Now, one of the things I'll discuss a little bit about, these amino acids, they are both 50-50% in a racemization mixture. means, you know, they are both 50% uh, was left-handed, 50% was right-handed, and it will play a very important role in the origin of life. And then, of course, scientists, they change the gases, and they really developed lots of other building blocks of life. For example, if you take CO2, then you can get this nuclear tiles of this, <coughs> you know, nucleic acids, okay? Still, they came up with all kinds of chemistry in the lab, and finally they really gave it up. They said, you know, something is wrong that we cannot produce really the life and maybe the time was the main thing which you cannot simulate in the lab. So this is the very first attempt. The second discipline, of course, we know that meteorites, in car, in, which come in two forms, comets, which is the icy, and the asteroids, which are the rocky, and of course, you know, there are snowballs. In fact, comets played a very important role. You know, the one of the most important requirements in our planet is the water. And no doubt, you know, the water came from comets. And also these comets, you know, they contain most of the building blocks of life. We don't have to go to through the mirror experiment. It's already there. Space has already created. And we all know that in the beginning of our planet, this called Hadean, it means hellish. During this Hadean period, almost for the first 600 million years, our planet was bombarded day and night by these comets and meteorites. Along with it, they brought water, they brought all the organic molecules, our sterile art are getting, you know, rich and rich and rich in organic molecules. Now, this is the most controversial. And it's so happening, we are also doing at the same time field work in this area in Alan Hills, Antarctica. Okay, in fact, this is our camp you can see, and this is where we're getting lots of fossils. Okay, Antarctica at that time was a sort of like a, you know, temperate forest, and lots of plant fossils and others here, there. And these guys from NASA, you know, it's the best place to collect meteorite is Antarctica. Because, you know, on the ice background, you see this you know, black rock floating. Okay? So each year, you know, they go, and so this is snowmobile they use, and since we're, you know, camping, it's a small little area, they have just come, have a, you know, a cup of coffee, and show their prize specimens. And I never knew that at that time, they collect this famous LH in 84 one, this meteorite. Okay? They found in 1984, and in 1996, President Clinton announced 
that is, you know, the first life on Mars. Okay? It is still very controversial. This is how this so-called nanobacteria may look like. Many scientists, you know, do not believe. Of course, if there is a life, because this piece really came from Mars, and if there is a life on this, you know, meteorite, then of course it would be even much easier. This is one of the old Arrhenius space formula theory that you know life really came from outer space, maybe by meteorite or you know comets and populated our planet. Maybe this is not true, but you know the whole curiosity, this program which is right going on by NASA is exactly just to find a little bacteria. That's all. And uh, after two years, you are going to hear something exciting. There's no doubt about it. <coughs> Chances are very, very high that some kind of very primitive bacteria should be there on Mars. Again, I'm sort of repeating. So you see, this is a typical, you know, plate reconstruction. You can see this is the spreading ridge where the plates to move about. This is the trench where it is subducting. The mountains are formed. This is how the ocean forms. So if you look at any map, you will see these are the plate boundaries. These are mainly the ridge where the plates are, you know, spreading apart. So in 1977, there was something new happened, you know, from University of Oregon. They wanted to see just here, okay? So this submersible will go two, three miles deep to the ocean floor, right here in the Galapagos Island, just to see. And what they found, this huge black smoker, they are coming, and there they found this, really they witnessed the Garden of Eden. Entirely new kind of life. When they found this rift here, they didn't know whether it's a plant or animal. They found big plants, fish, and others. They are all supported by a new ecosystem. At the base of the food chain, there is a bacteria called you know, heat loving bacteria. Now, are thermophiles. I'll you know, talk about many times because they may be the oldest life still present today. So again, you see entirely different field, but they contributed one of the most important thing in this you know, debate, in this big picture about the origin of life. Then, of course, this is really my field, and so this father and son, Louis and Walter Alvarez, and this is a place in Gubi, Italy. This is the KT boundary. That means this is the Cretaceous. This is the time of the dinosaur, and this is the time of this, you know, mammals. Of course, it's a many sections. And, right, this is the boundary. And for a hundred years, you know, everybody knew that dinosaur died out. But this is for the first time, it's a very scientific outlook. So what geologist's son did, Walter, he took a sort of samples from, you know, from bottom to the top, and gave it to his Nobel laureate father, Louis, and see whether there is anything in this boundary. And guess what? Louis found that there's a huge spike of a sort of very rare element called iridium, you know, very shiny like platinum. And that is basically very common in carbonaceous meteorite. And they found it every KT boundary section in the world. And they came up with this, you know, brilliant idea that yes, about 65 million years ago, a meteorite crashed, and this is the end of the dinosaur. Suddenly, you know, geologists never talked about meteorites. It has created so much excitement. People really try to look any crater. Okay, NASA really made a sort of huge team. You know, they would take photographs because many craters they look like a sort of circular ring. So you can really detect from space, and then you go there and just collect a little sample if they show any damn anomaly or shocked part, you know it's a crater. So again, there is a research of interest about impact cratering process. For the first time, geologists realized that impact cratering is really one of the most important geologic force side by side. <coughs> it's realized it is also a biologic force. It, in biology, it is a game changer. Think about Darwinian, Darwinian evolution is very slow and sort of steady process. But whenever there is a mass extinction, 
suddenly everything changes. You start with a new slate, okay? And it gives the opportunity those who are sort of, you know, meek, those who are sort of, you know, oppressed. So the role of meteorite, you know, in evolution is becoming, and as well as in geology, becoming more and more important. Similarly, we also found this another crater right here on the western shelf of India called Shiva crater. This is the largest crater, about 500 you know, kilometer diameter. And mind you, both Chikshiva and Shiva, they are the largest oil field. Because whenever there is a crater, this is the ideal petroleum trap. This gentleman probably made one of the most profound contributions in molecular biology, Carlos. Again, independent. He was not working on the original life. He wanted to classify all life in a very simple, entirely on the basis of RNA. And what he found, that all lives could be really classified into three big classes or three big domains. One is bacteria, which we know. One is archaea. They look like bacteria, but they're more derived. Still single cells, still without any nucleus. And finally, the eukarya or eukaryote, on which you know, Margaret Smith is sort of contribution. So, you know, all life can be classified, you know, on the basis of, you know, molecular biology into these three domains. Okay? And as you go down to the tree, you see this yellow? This is the heat-loving bacteria. This is the oldest form of life still present today. This is the last universal ancestor. What scientists, what the chemists have been looking for so many years, there's a positive answer. Look, this is the one you are looking for. You don't have to imagine. So you see, from all these fields, evidence are all coming together, missing together. The mist is getting, you know, sort of diluted. 